Hi, and welcome. I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, Presbyterian Minister of Three Congregations in Eastern Ontario. And thank you for joining us for this week's service. So take a moment while I ch share the screen and prepare for worship. Our call to worship is responsive. Gather this day in silence and hope. We wait for God's word for us. Let your hearts and spirits be open. God is our strength and salvation. His compassion and mercy are available to all. We eagerly wait for God's grace to come upon us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And at the end, when I say something like in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray saying, I invite you to join us, join in with the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. O oh God, you are our light and our salvation. When we are with you, we have nothing to fear. Open our hearts to your word this day. Help us to discern truth from lies. And above all, make us ready to follow you on wherever path you take us. Teach us to trust you wholly. God, you call us as you called so many. And we are moved when we think of Jonah, who, after running from you as far as he could, still came back and did what you asked. We are humbled when we read about those first disciples. Jesus called them and they dropped everything and followed. We are humbled because we know we probably wouldn't have done the same thing. We have responsibilities and ties which keep us from following you. You call and like Jonah, we find excuses. We do that so often. People in need, we run. People in pain, we turn away. People with doubts, and that includes us. God, forgive us. Thank you for being forgiving. Thank you for being persistent. Thank you for understanding our confusion and our doubts. Thank you for understanding our mixed priorities. And thank you for calling us over and over and over again, like you did, Jonah. And thank you for helping us sort truth from falsehood. Most of all, thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hear now a word of pardon. Don't be afraid. God is with you. That is the good news. You don't have to go through life alone, wondering if anyone cares about you or knows your heart. God knows. God loves you and forgives you for your mistakes. You are a forgiven people. Amen. Our first hymn is God of Mercy, God of Grace.
we prepare to hear God's word, let us join together in prayer. Let us pray all together. Lord, open our hearts to hear your word. Silence in us anything that would lead us away from you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our responsive reading is from Psalm 62, verses 5 to 12. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. I invite you to say, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, and they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion, and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, and twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, world without end. Amen. If you're following the lectionary, our gospel lesson is chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. However, since I'm preaching on only two of those verses, those are the two I put up, and I put up them up from two different versions. So Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, from the New International Version, it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, after John was put in prison, this is from the New King James Version, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And in case you didn't know it, gospel means good news. The sermon today, the title is Cheap Grace, God's Grace. During the pandemic, I've been watching a, a lot of videos, YouTube videos. And one of the videos I came across this week was titled QAnon Believers Splinter After President Joe Biden's Inauguration. The video claimed that the conspiracy cult QAnon was unraveling as members had to face the fact that this revolution or revolt that was supposed to keep Trump in power never came about. And Joe Biden was actually the President of the United States. The question many of us are asking in this post-Trump era is how do we deprogram the Trump cultists? I do want to distinguish between those who supported Trump, say those Republicans who supported Trump because they liked his policies, because he said what they, uh, uh, they held the same views that, that uh, he did, uh, or he held the same views that they did, so views about immigration, about the wall, about, and they, they supported him with that. And then you had others, sort of the, the, the cult ones, who like Trump, whatever he said, whatever he claimed, uh, they just agreed with him, supported him, and they would ignore all the news media that, uh, th that said anything contrary to what Trump was preaching. Those cultists, how do we reach them? But that got me thinking, okay, that's a good question to ask, but what about Christians? 
how do we sort through what is good teaching and bad teaching? And I started thinking about televangelists. And we know that there are some very good televangelists. And uh, of course, one of my favorites was Billy Graham. But we also know that there were bad ones. There were ones that really preached this gospel of success. Whatever you want, God's waiting to give it to you. Pray, pray hard. Send me some money and I'll pray with you and you'll get it. You want a Cadillac? God will send you a Cadillac. You want a miracle cure? God's just waiting to give you this miracle cure. And if you're like me, you're sort of like cringing. Oh my God, this is so far from what Jesus preached. What they're offering is cheap grace. Hey, you want God's favor? God's just waiting to give it to you. Pray and heal. And I'm just like, oh. But they exist for a reason. There must be something good about them. What's good? Well, one thing that's good is they do take prayer seriously, even if they're twisting it. They're focusing. They've recognized that a lot of Christians don't take prayer as seriously as we should. We pray, but we don't really expect God to act. You know, it's like we're praying for a cure, someone to get better, and deep down we know they're not, and we don't believe they will. We don't think God is going to answer our prayer. So the televangelists, the bad ones, do remind us to take prayer more seriously. But as I said, what they offer is cheap grace. It's like God's just waiting, waiting for us to ask and he'll give it to us. The implications of that kind of message is if you're successful, God is on your side. If you're not successful, it's because you've done something wrong. You're at fault. You don't have enough faith. You're not praying enough. You're not sending in enough money to this. You've left God. That's cheap grace. Today's gospel just reminds us that grace is not cheap. Following God does not mean bad things won't happen to you. And we see it right at the beginning, at verse 14. John the Baptist is arrested and put into prison. And this is a guy who was basically a prophet, the forerunner to Jesus. He called people to repent. He pointed people to Jesus. And you think, you know, okay, Jesus' ministry is taking off. John's ministry can wind down. Maybe God can make him become one of the disciples. Or maybe God will just let him retire. But no, he's arrested, thrown into prison, and eventually killed. God's grace does not come cheap. It's not a free pass for a successful life. God doesn't tell us why bad things happen to good people. He doesn't tell us why John the Baptist was arrested or why it was in his plan for John the Baptist to be arrested. The way it's written in the Gospel of Mark, it sort of frames Jesus' ministry. And we know Jesus' ministry is going to conclude with another arrest and execution, this one of Jesus himself. So the beginning and the end of Jesus' ministry is framed by people, God's people, going to prison and suffering for their faith, for their obedience to God, and being killed. God's grace isn't cheap. It comes with John's sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the sacrifice of many good people, many Christians along the way. And we have to ask, 
is it worth it? Well, I can't answer that. Not for you. You have to answer it for yourself. But I can point out a couple of things. One of which you already know. God loves us. God is our father, our mother, our parent, however you want to describe him or her. And so if we can accept that, chances are we already know why bad things sometimes happen to good people. If we've ever had children, I've never had children, I've had a pet, my chihuahuas right on my side. The answer is obvious. If you've never had a child, never had pets, you may have to use your imagination, but I don't think it's that hard to, to a stretch to imagine it. If a parent gives their children everything they ever wanted, everything they ever asked for, what do you end up with? Spoiled rats. If you end up with a dog or a cat, that you've never disciplined, that you've just let do whatever they wanted, what do you end up with? A spoiled dog or cat. Parents say no from to time to time. No, we can't afford it. No, you have to eat the food that's in front of you. No, we don't have the time. We can't take that much time to do go there. No, you can't stay home. You have to go to school. No, you can't play with your friends just now because you have to finish your homework. No, you can't do whatever you want to do. And no, I won't smooth things out for you. You're going to have to accept responsibility for your actions. In learning about no, about not getting whatever it is that we wanted to get or to do. We learn about values, about priorities, about consideration of others, about consequences, about rules we need to follow if we're going to live in a society around other people and live in relative harmony with other people. God is our parent and God is a good parent, and that's why sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. Sometimes we can figure out why, sometimes we can't. When does God does say no and does let bad things happen to us, what impact do those bad things have on us? Do they build our character? Do they make us better human beings? Or do we get angry and hurt and more broken? I don't know. For myself, I think I've become a better person and probably a bit more compassionate. You'll have to decide for yourself. God's grace is not cheap. Somehow, bad things happening to us they do fit into God's overall plan. And the overall plan is the salvation of all of creation. The recreation of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. But our gospel message doesn't leave us with that darkness of John's arrest. It juxtaposes that arrest with the beginning of Jesus's ministry, as I've said, but it's the proclaiming of the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand or near, as some translations put it. What does that mean? Well, for centuries, prophets have been talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which is basically the same. So people had an idea of what that must be like. You know, the lion lying down with the lamb, swords being turned into plowshares, the poor having food to eat, no hoarding, 
or price gouging by the rich. Justice for all, no corruption, no buying off the judges by the rich. No wars, no illnesses, no hunger, no poverty, no crime, no injustice of any kind, no deaths. People would live longer, forever, giving God glory and praise. It's a vision that we dream of even today. And while we may not really want to sit around on a cloud playing a harp, singing, giving God glory, most of us do want a place where we can live in peace and free from fear. But Jesus' message, even though he's talking about the same thing, it actually is different from that of the prophets because they talked of vision. Jesus said it was at hand or near. It was so close that people could experience it for themselves. The Greek is sort of ambiguous. It can be translated either way. That's probably why the early disciples and the early Christians believed that Jesus would be returning any day. He died on the cross. He'd come back from the dead. He'd been transformed in some way. He rose up to heaven, and we knew he was going to come back, or we know he will come back. And that return is going to be the start of the kingdom of God. All those people had to do was be faithful and wait the days or weeks or months, eventually years, until that happened. I think that is part of the meaning. But there's another part in that phrase that Jesus talks about. He's giving the people the chance to experience God's kingdom in the here and now of their own lives. Stop and think, what did Jesus do while he was alive? How did he reflect the kingdom of God in his own ministry? Jesus made no distinctions between rich and poor, between the holy people who kept God's laws and the unholy, the lawbreakers who broke them, between educated people that he could have theological discussions with, like Nicodemus, and the uneducated people, the farmers, the fishermen, who knew their stuff, but may not have known all the big words in the theology. Jesus didn't make a distinction between male and female. Even though he acknowledged distinctions between Jews and non-Jews, in the end, it really didn't affect how he treated them. The distinctions didn't matter. Were people hungry? He performed a miracle and fed them. Were people sick? Again, he performed miracles and healed them. Were people afraid? One of the messages over and over again, Jesus says, fear not, do not be afraid. It's me. Had people broken God's laws? And he reached out with them with a message of peace and forgiveness and saying, is your sin worse than theirs? Who is without sin? And if they can't condemn you, then I'm not going to either. Were people angry? Did they want to fight, overthrow their oppressors? Then Jesus talked about turning the other cheek, refusing to lift on arms, praising peacemakers. Now, I did have a youth in Sunday school once who rejected Jesus. He said, Jesus is a sissy. I don't want anything to do with him. He just lets people walk all over him. So to remind you, I just pointed him towards the book of Revelation and also to what I'm going to tell you to remind you that we're not talking about a sissy, but about God, who is the all-powerful. Remember, 
when there were turbulent storms in the Sea of Galilee, people were afraid for their lives. And Jesus calmed the waters. The storms obeyed him. Nature obeyed him. He commanded, and it was so. When people had turned the temple grounds into a marketplace, and profit became more important than helping people buy something that they could offer to God, and then Jesus became angry. He drove out the money changers, the bankers, and store owners who had commercialized God's house of prayer. In other words, God's actions and teachings turned that vision of God's kingdom into something tangible that people could experience for themselves. For those of us who have experienced that kingdom of God in our own lives, in some way, even if only briefly. Yeah, God's grace is worth the sacrifice and pain. It's worth having bad things happen. For centuries, Christian leaders have tried to copy what Jesus did to bring a bit of heaven on earth. That's the underlying premise of why we have Hospitals to look after the sick, nursing homes, retirement homes, so on, to look after the vulnerable. Healthcare programs to look after the sick, whether or not they could afford it. Anti-poverty programs, food banks, unemployment insurance, looking after, helping those who were less fortunate. That's why we have laws against discrimination and corruption and laws to ensure that there's equal justice for all, regardless of rich or poor, male or female, Christian or non-Christian, ethnicity doesn't matter. We're trying to build that city of God, as Augustine described it, as Calvin tried to do in Geneva, Switzerland. We're trying to build countries that reflect heaven on earth in Canada, in the States, New England, New Scotland, New Foundland, lands of promise where we could begin again with the promise of God's kingdom. The only problem is we're not God. We're flawed human beings. And so we have failed time and time again. And we have hurt people in the process. But that's what we were trying to do and why. So now the question, which would you prefer? Cheap grace that promises a life without pain, but uh, leaves the world a really bad place. Or God's grace that promises a relatively short life with pain and mistakes but a life that ultimately will be transformed into something we've longed for all our lives and something that will be ours for all eternity. Cheap grace, God's grace. The choice is yours. Amen. Our next hymn is Follow Me, The Master Said. And there's a problem here. I found the music, but not the words. It was not a version that had the words with them. So here are the words and the music's going to come. So my apologies on that. If you have a hymn book, it's hymn number 483 in the old Presbyterian hymn book. Follow me, the master said. Thank you.
this is where we would normally have the offering. And so I do invite you to think of how you can support your local church. If you want to support our churches, uh, if we are your church, uh, you have information at the bottom of the page there, our website, also uh, e-transfers, mail, Canada Helps, you can also make donations there. Let us join together in prayer. God, Father, all that we have comes from you. All that we are comes from you. Accept our gifts as expressions of our thanks. Use them, use us as you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I do every week, we have closing prayers, and the homework is I'm going to stop the share. Our homework is to find five things to give thanks for, pray for five groups, people, or situations, add your own prayers. And in a Presbytery cycle of prayer this week, we're praying for the Presbytery ministry animator, who just happens to be me, too, in my second job. And uh, so I work with, I believe it's 42 congregations in the Presbytery of Ottawa and the Presbytery of Sea Lake Langery. And um, I'm there to help support uh, the leaders in the clergy, uh, do some leadership development in uh, Seaway Glengarry, work with the youth Christian educators in the Presbytery of Ottawa, arrange for some or plan uh, some major events. So, yes, uh, especially during COVID, my ability to plan events has been severely curtailed. So I, I would appreciate prayers. So let's pray. Dear God, once again, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the chance of coming together to worship. We thank you that for the past week, we thank you that our, the inauguration went so well and that there were no protests or very few protests across the country. And so we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for our friends and families. We thank you for the frontliners, for the doctors, for everyone working so hard to, to keep our society functioning. We pray for them. Please keep them safe. We pray especially at this time for people in nursing homes across the country, across the continent. The, the elderly are so vulnerable and if they haven't been vaccinated, Lord, just please be with them. Please be with the families, with the staff. The staff have been wonderful. They've, the nursing staff, uh, doctors, they've put themselves out so much during this pandemic. And they must be burning out. And we just ask you, hold them in your arms, hold them in your hands. Just keep them close to you and fill them with your, your peace and your love. Lord, please, as we pray always, please be with our leaders, giving them wisdom and courage to know what to do and how to do it. Please protect our, our families and our friends. Keep them safe. Please protect us. Lord, we pray that this pandemic be over soon. At this time in our Presbytery cycle, Lord, we also pray for the Presbytery ministry animator just to Help her and uh, let her work be productive and in tune with what you will. Lord, at this time, we offer prayers in the silence of our heart. We ask that you accept all our prayers for we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation. <laughs> Thank you. 
as we prepare to leave our time to wor of worship, go forth joyfully. God is with you. Bring peace and hope to all whom you meet, and may God's eternal love shine through you. And the blessing of God who created you, the love of Christ who saves you, and the power and protection and compassion of the Holy Spirit who guides you, go with you now and always. Amen. Once again, I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, and I thank you for joining me in this time of worship. Take care. God bless. Have a good week. And see you next week. Bye-bye.